Afternoon, I'll call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Community Development Committee for the Metropolitan Council. I'm the Chair Robert Lilligan, joined by a quorum of the committee. Uh, for folks assembled, folks listening, and for committee members, I'll let you know we have a hard stop at 5.30 today oh, so that they uh, can do a video, audio video reset before the um, Equity Advisory Committee meeting at 6. So uh, just a heads up there, so we'll move as quickly as possible through the agenda. And the first item is approval of an agenda. Unless there are changes, additions, corrections, we'll consider it approved. Seeing that, we have an agenda. Next is approval of the December 19th, 2022 Community Development Committee meetings. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion, additions, corrections? Hearing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries, and we'll move on to our consent agenda. Four items. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Thank you. Discussion, hearing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Great, and now we're on to our first non-consent business item, which is 2023-29. It's the funding recommendations for the local housing incentives account pilot program, and Ms. Johnson is here to present on that. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. Afternoon. Good afternoon. So I am Ashley Johnson, the manager of the Local Housing Incentives Account, one of the four grant accounts under the Livable Communities Act team. Um, and we'll hop right in. Today I am presenting on the affordable homeownership pilot under the Local Housing Incentives Account. All right. Okay, so LCA, as I stated, uh, includes LHIA, and it primarily provides money for participating communities to reach their affordable housing goals. Uh, furthermore, it uh, provides funding for multifamily and single family housing development or home ownership. Um, and then it funds preservation and new development. Uh, LHIA also requires a local match, which we will talk a little bit about um, in terms of the applications this year. And it is generally pooled with Minnesota Housing's funding and the consolidated RFP. However, last year, $2 million was approved for this homeownership pilot in April. So today's presentation has three parts. Uh, first, I'll go over the application and evaluation process for this pilot, then introduce the funding recommendations and summarize the projects. Okay, first the overview of the application and evaluation process. So last year, these were the LHAA priorities that were approved for the pilot. There were two main priorities. As you can see on the left, uh, one was geographic choice, and on the right, the other was racial equity. So bulleted under both of these uh, priorities are a breakdown of how we evaluate it for them. On the left, you can see for geographic choice, we considered or prioritized cities with higher shares of single family housing and higher sales prices versus the regional average. And on the right, you can see that we prioritize cities with higher, shell, higher shares of black and indigenous residents and residents of color, and also uh, cities with higher home ownership disparities versus the regional average. And to evaluate the pilot proposals, we uh, scored for these priorities with a minimum score of five points, which all cities in the region currently that are LCA participating cities uh, can achieve those five points. So all of the applicants at least achieved those five points. Uh, next, I'll hop into our scoring. And I just talked about the geographic choice uh, and the two bullets at the top. The geographic choice and the racial equity. Um, however, moving below that, those two buckets, we also evaluate applications in three more areas. So first is the proposal's uh, efforts to engage underserved populations. Second, if a proposal addresses unique local needs, so that can be uh, cultural local needs, such as uh, Sharia compliant financing or demographic, uh, like larger units for relatively larger households. 
And then third, we also evaluate the applications for depth of affordability and the length of the affordability term. So to kick off our recommendations, uh, we'll begin by showing a summary of all of the applications submitted. So we had 16 proposals for the pilot. This table may be a little hard to see, but we didn't want to just like continue with the slides. Uh, these proposals are listed in the order of which uh, the points that they scored. So the highest is at the top, the lowest is at the bottom. And the proposals spanned at least 10 different cities, including Bloomington, Roseville, Minneapolis, Golden Valley, Richfield, St. Paul, Eaton Prairie, Chaska, Edina, and Minnetonka, with additional scattered site homes in Washington and Anoka County. Um, we are proposing to fund nine of these 16 projects. Uh, that means, if approved, seven applications from this list will go unfunded. And this just illustrates the sustained need for affordable housing in our community, in our region. Uh, the pilot scoring committee included two uh, Met Council community development staff. Of course, I was excluded. And we also had external partners for the, from the Minnesota Homeownership Center evaluate applications. So we received more applications than expected for the pilot, which is great. But therefore, staff recommended that we set an award ceiling of $300,000 uh, per award and further recommended that we make partial awards to the applicants to maximize the number of applicants who could actually receive awards. So uh, to summarize those seven applications that didn't receive funding, Two proposals were ineligible due to a lack of available uh, match funds. And I'll note that one of the proposals that did not have match funds, the, um, uh, I think the one in uh, Bell Lofts, um, actually scored relatively high. So evaluating local match support is something that is most likely really important uh, because had they had the support, the application would have moved forward. Uh, five additional proposals were not recommended for pilot funding based on their scores or their ranking. So with $8.2 million in total requests, the total number of unfunded requests is over $6.2 million. So as you see, uh, the top application scored uh, Bloomington scored 77.5 points. Uh, the max that any application could have received is 147. So we basically added up all the possible scores amongst the three score sheets, and um, these were the scores. So I'll move on to our funding recommendations, but I'll pause here just in case there's any questions. Committee members, questions for Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson, I do have a question on slide four, and it's more out of curiosity, and this might not be something that you can answer one more back. Right at the top of your head, but on the racial equity side, mm -hmm. you know, and you have these two sort of overarching criteria, maybe, or descriptions. And I'm just wondering if those, as we analyze those who have uh, a higher um, demographic of BIPOC people and those with the higher disparities, are those usually the same cities? Or do we find that there's actually a difference between sort of concentrations of population and disparities of ownership? There is a correlation between those two. Okay. Yep. I figured. I was just wondering. Yeah. Yep, thank you're you. spot on, um, Chair. There is a correlation between those two. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think no other questions from the committee, so please continue. All right. So these are the nine proposals that we are um, recommending funding for. So nine projects, a total of $2 million. And these proposals would be for 25 homes spanning, 10, um, spanning eight cities, uh, not including those scattered site uh, lots in Washington and Anoka County. And notably, five applicants recommended for funding through the pilot have not been awarded for LHIA funds in the past five years. Mm. Uh, so it was really cool to kind of look through these applications. They're all very different. Um, if you want to see the geographic spread of these applications, let's see, we have a map uh, in the business item. The applications and awards span 12 of the 16 council districts. Uh, the only application, the only districts that we don't uh, include is 1, 4, 15, and 16. 
Uh, however, if the pilot is approved as an <laughs> existing program, I plan to reach out to 1, 14, 15, and 16. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember oh, yeah. Bento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question on the map. In yep. the um, what I think is Anoka County, maybe, mm -hmm. um, there's an eight there. Oh, yes. That is... That is uh, from the scattered site projects. So we approved one project in partnership with Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity that has a collaboration between Washington County CDA and Anoka County. Got it. Okay. Got yep. It. So the I homes. Just... Oh, I'm sorry. Through the chair. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, yeah. So they could be anywhere within those two counties. Yeah. Don't worry. I. I... I don't acknowledge him enough either. So. That's all right. And he doesn't throw the gavel, I'll take so you're it personally. Good. <laughs> it's well, safe. Professional. Yeah, we're pretty casual here. Any other questions, community members? Council Member Lee. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, so for the five cities that were, uh, however many cities there were that didn't get awarded in the past five years, mm -hmm. um, do we, was it because they didn't apply or we rejected them uh, five years in a row? Or, or how and why did they come back? Do you know? Yeah, so for the five that didn't, oh, through the chair, for the five that didn't receive funding, uh, LHIA funding, uh, they were not, they did not apply. Um, but some of the five received LCA funding. So from other, uh, like LCDA or TOD, mm -hmm. they just were not recipients of the affordable housing development funds through LHIA. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Further questions, Councilmember Chambliss. Yes, my question actually is um, whether or not those that received from funds from another source like LCA, mm -hmm. were they for the same project or different projects? Ms. Johnson. Through the chair, Councilmember Chambliss, that's a good question. Uh, do you mind stating it one more time? Um, yeah, I'm trying. Um, the reason for my question is just wondering if. Um, if an organization chose, for whatever reason, not to apply or they were not um, awarded, mm -hmm. uh, do we know if uh, these cities seek other sources of funds for the same projects? Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes, we do not know currently if uh, those, the cities or counties uh, that apply did not receive funding from other sources. Um, but that is something that I can look into and follow up with you on. Councilmember Chess, I think we have a little more response as well from Director Brahas. Oh, oh I thought he's no. wanted to say something. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, I misunderstood. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, Ms. Johnson. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you. Further questions before we move on? Great, hearing none, Ms. Johnson. Nice. All right, so this first table, we have two of them. Uh, this first one shows the potential impact of pilot funding, or one of the potential impacts of pilot funding. So here, we show the available funds for LHIA in the given funding cycle, in any given funding cycle of the past five years. So those are the gray bars that you see from 2018 to uh, 2022. And then you can also see the number of grants awarded. And that is the orange line. So the gray bars are uh, funding available in a cycle. And then the orange line is the number of grants awarded in comparison. So this chart shows that even with a decrease in funding dollars from 21, 2021 to 2022, uh, with the addition of pilot funding, it is possible to award almost double the amounts of grants than previous years on uh, LHIA. And digging a little deeper, so in comparison, last year we made four home ownership, four home ownership awards, and this year we're making potentially 14. So um, in the next chart, that'll dig a little bit deeper. Uh, but let me see. Oh yes, this graph is the average awarded dollar per unit uh, that we funded with LHIA in the past five years. So the average is about eight to $16,000 per unit. And the share of home ownership units is the blue line. So the yellow bars um, count the average awarded dollar per unit, and that includes multifamily and single family. Uh, with the note that per unit spending for home ownership projects is typically higher for single family or home ownership uh, projects. 
So the share of home ownership units, of course, from 2021, as we stated, increased between the two years uh, to 20% or almost 20% of the funding that we awarded this past year, uh, when there's been an average of 5% of our funding that, have, that has went to home ownership projects. So let's hop into the projects. A summary of these proposals are included at the end of the business item. Uh, our first project that we are recommending funding for is the Bloomington Affordable Home Ownership Project. And we are recommending an award of 300,000 for four new homes in Bloomington. Uh, these homes will be affordable at or below 80% of AMI, uh, but the team is prioritizing uh, pr prioritizing uh, under 50%, at or below 50% of AMI. And Bloomington plans to construct these single family homes on vacant lots and prioritize first time and first generation home buyers with the potential for down payment assistance for the buyer. This project is our only um, non-CLT or perpetually affordable project. It is affordable at um, at least 15 years and the development partner is Habitat for Humanity. Our next proposal is uh, for Eden Prairie and Homes Within Reach, their CLT program. We are recommending $160,000 for two new or rehabilitated homes in Eden Prairie. Uh, these would be affordable at or below 80% of AMI, uh, but prioritizing at or below 60% of AMI. And this is a community land trust project. The Eden Prairie and Homes Within Reach partnership has already brought 18 homes uh, into the Eden Prairie uh, Community Land Trust. Next, we have Ernst House CLT. And this project has been previously funded or supported with um, LHAA dollars in 2020, or one part of this project. And this is the other part of this project that's coming through and asking for pilot funds. We are recommending $189,000 for new or rehabbed homes in Chaska. These will be affordable at or below 80% of AMI. And these are a part of the Carver County CLT program, so another land trust program. And they will remain permanently affordable for subsequent buyers. Um, and the first a uh, part of this uh, project was the, re the rehab of a historically significant home on uh, one of the lots. And that's what we supported uh, back in 2020. And then the second is now um, this single family portion. Um, and all homes will, this is a really cool project. I like that all homes have their own private outdoor space and they're centered around like a common outdoor space. Mm -hmm. So it's a really mm -hmm. cool design. Next, we have Home Ownership Program for Equity, or HOPE. Uh, this is a project in the city of Golden Valley. We are recommending 224,000 for two new or rehabilitated homes. These will be affordable at 80% of AMI, I'd like to note, um, yet prioritizing 60% AMI. Uh, this is a partnership between the city of Golden Valley, Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity, and Greater Metropolitan Housing Corporation. I feel like it's GMHC. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the homes will remain affordable for. <laughs> I was like, wait, something left off. The homes will remain affordable for 99 years, and uh, the proposal said that it will prioritize applications from organizations that have demonstrated success in building relationships or trust with Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and serving first-generation home buyers. So our next recommendation is Margaret Street, and this is in the city of St. Paul. We are recommending $50,000 to renovate one home. Um, this is all that their proposal included. However, it'll be affordable at or below 50%, at or below 80% of AMI. And the county will convey the property to a nonprofit organization uh, that will sell the property to an eligible home buyer and provide down payment assistance. And this home is a part of a pilot program that aims to uh, concurrently provide housing, job, and training opportunities, uh, and intentionally engaging people of color. And that's the home pictured there. 
And almost lastly, second to last, is the Perpetually Affordable Homeownership Project in Minneapolis. We are recommending 300,000 for four new or rehabilitated homes in the city of Minneapolis. These will be affordable at or below 80% of AMI. And this is a community of lakes, uh, community land trust, City of Lakes Community Land Trust, or CLCLT project, uh, through their home buyer initiated program. And this will assist home buyers, the HIP program will assist home buyers in purchasing these homes. Next, we have Roseville Community Land Trust. We're recommending 300 for 300,000 for four new or rehabilitated homes in Roseville affordable at or below 80% of AMI, prioritizing at or below 60% of AMI. And this is a partnership with Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. Many of our projects are for this pilot. Um, and eligible households must be first time home buyers <coughs> unless a previous home was lost due to foreclosure. And this project explicitly stated that they will prioritize engaging BIPOC households in their community. Ms. Jonathan, question from Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the people that have previously had lost a home due to foreclosure, are they also helping them figure out whatever went wrong the last time so it doesn't happen again? Ms. Johnson. Through the chair, that is a very good question. They did not include that in the, their application, but that would be good to know because they are the only uh, applicant that actually included that information at all. Um, Councilmember Bento. Mr. Chair, um, I, I may be wrong because it's been 11 or 12 years since I served on the Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity Board, but it had been very much a part of their, the foundation of Twin Cities Habitat that um, home ownership um, skills were a part of, of the support that they provided the families prior to them acquiring the homes. Mm -hmm. And that included the financial management and maintenance of the homes. So that they, they have a history and a strong commitment to that, that piece of it. And I believe that's still the case today. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And uh, during my time on Minneapolis City Council, we're always looking for those kind of supports for first time home buyers or lower wealth home buyers. And Habitat had the most robust yeah. curriculum at that time. It's almost ancient history now. <laughs> but at that time, that, that well, was the case. And Mr. Council Chair, it, um, it, if I might, I want to add that Hannah Palmeyer's mother, Sarah Palmeyer, mm -hmm. um, back at the time that I first joined the board at Habitat was the person in charge, and she just did a really phenomenal job with family services at Habitat. Great, right, thanks for sharing. Council Member Wolf, anything else? No, nope, that was Great. it, thank cool. you. Other questions from committee members? Seeing none at this time, Ms. Johnson. Our next proposal is, our next recommendation is Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity, and this is that scattered site project uh, in Anoka in Washington County. We are recommending 285,000 uh, for the rehabilitation of three homes within those counties. Uh, they will be affordable to habitat buyers with incomes between 30% and 80% of AMI. And the potential cities are listed below. They identified those cities and how we scored this project is we averaged uh, the scores for each individual city. So this threw a little bit of a wrench in our, in our scoring, <laughs> but we figured it out. And last but definitely not least, because this was a very interesting application and I'm so happy it came through and got funded, we're recommending $192,000 for three new manufactured homes in the city of Richfield. These will be affordable at or below 80% of AMI. And this is a partnership between the city of Richfield and Woodlawn Terrace. So they aim to add new double wide manufactured homes. I'm not sure what that is, but <laughs> we'll find out. And, dem and demolish two existing homes. And the units are expected to sell for $150,000. Mr. Chair. Councilmember Vento. Double wide means that when they transport them on mm -hmm. the highway, they're going to take up a lot more than just one lane. <laughs> I usually transport them in two halves. Right, but sometimes stick them together. Yeah. yeah. 
You would know that if you listen to more country music like I do. <laughs> <laughs> and like me, you grew up in northern Anoka County. <laughs> uh, see, I knew there was a reason. We <laughs> could do a special <laughs> class on that. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Pinto. There are cultural dynamics that come with the term double wide. I think that's what we're referring to. We Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson. And now um, I will turn it over to Councilmember Lilligren. Uh, but before, I will ask that the Metropolitan Council award nine homeownership local housing incentives account grants totaling two million and that the council authorize its executive director of community development to execute the grant agreements on behalf of the council. Thank you for the report and your work on this, Ms. Johnson. I'm gonna ask it, I think, before somebody else on the committee. But I'm just interested in the progression of the pilot, right? So now we're getting more data under our belts. I love the increase in funded projects. I think that's something that we should be proud of. But then what, what happens next? Yes, Chair Lilligren. So uh, Sarah, my supervisor, she is proposing that we fund the pilot for another year, or that it becomes a existing program of LHIA. So that will come in the next presentation. Okay. Uh, we hope that it's included in the FDP. Great, thank you for that. Further questions, committee members? Council Member Cummings, then Lindstrom, then Wolf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, an easy question to me. Anyway, so I'm looking at slide 19, uh, yeah. the Twin Cities Habitat for, huma for Humanity, the three homes. Are these three mm -hmm. homes that Habitat already owns, or are these three that will come into their inventory? Ms. Yep, Johnson. it's three that will come into, oh, through the chair. It's three <laughs> <laughs> that will come into uh, their their fold. So they're already, they're not already acquired. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lindstrom. Uh, not a question, I just wanted to say, uh, um, I really like the, uh, the number of cities and entities that is participating, the geographic diversity. Um, going back to our previous, uh, the, the committee's previous conversations um, on this topic. Uh, speaking of, kind of as a homer here for a little bit, the, we were talking about the Roseville project and that is, that's a, a brand new partnership in the city of Roseville with Habitat, and, I, and we've already mentioned a lot of these are partnerships with Habitat, so love the public-private um, partnership aspect of this. And that's all I have to say. Okay. It's more of, a, more of a comment and, and, and no questions, and so I'm excited to vote yes on this when we get to that point. Thank you for sharing. Council Member Wolf, then Council Member Vento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm really intrigued by the one in Richfield with the, mm -hmm. the manufactured homes. By the way, if you want to see a double wide in person, there is a bar called the Double Wide in Elko <laughs> Newmarket. And it is in a double wide. I actually, uh, my colleague Hillary Lovelace had told me about this restaurant. <laughs> and I asked, I said, what does that even mean? <laughs> so, so there is a diversity of background and uh, from the LCA team that I appreciate. But I have to check out Double Y. So I'm, I'm intrigued by it because there's, it's, it's been a challenge for a lot of mobile homes to upgrade. You know, you get the, the 1960s tinder box that goes up in about 45 seconds yeah. and is a danger to all of its neighbors. You know, turning those over and replacing them with modern, energy efficient, well insulated units mm -hmm. is a great thing because this is very important owner occupied affordable housing. Lakeville has five manufactured home parks, Blooming, or Burnsville has a couple, Apple Valley has at least one. Um, so it's an opportunity in some places that might not be as affordable to have good quality affordable housing and partnering to make that happen because it's hard to finance a, a manufactured home because it's treated like a 
trailer, not a house, mm -hmm. and it depreciates. Um, but if, if we can do more of those sorts of partnerships mm -hmm. to help restore those communities, because a lot of places have closed theirs down, uh, St. Anthony being the famous one that didn't go very well, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of communities who want to preserve that affordable housing, and if we can partner with those communities to do things like this, to preserve and improve the existing manufactured home parks, I think it will be a, a great thing for the region to preserve that affordable housing. Great. Agree. Mm -hmm. Further discussion, Council Member Vento. I was just gonna move approval. Oh, great. Second. All right, we have a motion before <laughs> us. Again, thanks for the work. We look forward to seeing how it progresses. Any discussion on the motion? <laughs> Discussion. Hearing none, all approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Congratulations. We look forward to a report on the successes. So Committee members, that concludes our business item, our non-consent business item. We move on to information item. It's the 2023 Livable Communities Act funding availability and scoring criteria discussion. Uh, Sarah Burke is here to present on this and lead us in uh, lead us in discussion. So, Ms. Berkey, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Chair Lilligren and all. Thank you for being here. I'm Sarah Berkey. I'm the Senior Manager for Livable Communities and Housing, and um, this is my first time talking with you all it is. formally. Welcome. Congratulations. Um, so glad to be here and look forward to more. We're glad you're here too. So we have, uh, there, there's a lot to talk about here today with um, combining both an assessment of the fund availability for Livable Communities Act programs in 2023 and um, some refresh of the scoring criteria. Um, so and you- yeah. Committee members, if I can just assure you, I had a conversation with Ms. Berkey before this about how, the conver about how our uh, conversation will be managed today after it took me maybe two between two and a half and three hours <laughs> to read through the staff report and <laughs> dang so she assures me Sarah assures me that uh, that she has that wall in hand and we won't be spending a lot of time on on language that's been stricken but it will be a good discussion correct so. yeah and I certainly would defer to the chair and everyone on the committee about you know how, how much detail to get into. But for today, I wanted to give an overview of everything and then um, see what questions you have. Um, so we'll provide an overview of Livable Communities Act programs, uh, the funding availability that we see for this year, and then what staff would recommend in terms of allocating the funding to the various programs. Uh, I'll provide an overview of the scoring criteria framework that was um, it really implemented in 2021 that we proposed to continue for another year and then the next steps toward council approval of the plan. Uh, so tentatively, we'd ask the, the committee to uh, look at this again on February 6th at your next meeting and actually send it forward to council for full approval at that time. Uh, so today is just information and discussion and letting us know whether we're on track. Um, so Livable Communities Act programs uh, include LHIA, which you just heard about, uh, the Livable Communities Demonstration Act and the TOD version of it, as well as tax-based revitalization account. Uh, so under those rubrics, we have programs uh, that typically we would start advertising in about March if, of every year, and then would um, conduct different rounds of funding throughout the year. Um, and what we need to do before that all starts is to go through this plan and, and get your um, discussion and, and support for it and um, get formal approval of what we have available this year. So I've shown some tentative dates for what you might expect in terms of when programs will come to this committee for your review of the funding recommendations, but those are all subject to change um, depending on how things go throughout the year. Um, let's see, so. Our funding availability each year for Livable Communities Act programs comes through a combination of base revenue and reserves that can be allocated. Uh, some reserves are restricted to the specific funding programs and others are unrestricted within the overall LCA, Livable Communities Act Fund. 
And so uh, this chart that we provided here and in the information item shows what we have as a base and then what we have available. If we were to allocate all of our reserves, this is the maximum we have available. Um, typically each year, my understanding is that the council has approved deploying just a portion of the program reserves into the programs to augment that base revenue. And then additionally, the council has sometimes chosen to augment those um, those funding programs, especially the, uh, the local housing incentives account with additional sources of funding. Um, so for tax base revitalization account or TBRA this year, um, we have a $5 million base funding level that has not changed over the course of years that's in statute as well as um, the proposal to invest another half a million dollars um, from restricted reserves into this program. Um, under TBRA, we help clean up contaminated land and buildings for subsequent development. Uh, so these grants are intended to provide the greatest possible public benefit for the money that we have, strengthen the local tax base, and create jobs or preserve affordable, create or preserve affordable housing. Um, there are three different application paths for TBRA, the contamination cleanup, as well as site investigation, and then seeding equitable environmental development. Uh, for all of those programs this year in 2022, we actually saw slightly reduced demand. And so I wanted to, for each of these programs, just point out what is the current level of demand and what trends are we seeing in demand for the funds. Um, we had about $811,000 unspent this year. We hypothesized that could be an indication of reduced development activity due to changing market conditions, uh, but it's only one year of data. Um, regardless, we recommend level funding for 2023 based on that uncertainty at this point. Uh, for the local housing incentives account, um, as Ash just shared, the LHEA helps expand and preserve life cycle and affordable housing, both rental and ownership in the region. Um, our base funding allocation for LHEA each year is $1.5 million. Um, and then any additional funding for those programs this year um, at this point would come from the unrestricted reserves that we have available within LCA. Um, as Ash shared, we have really high demand for LHIA, and that is the case for single family and home ownership programs as well as for multifamily programs. Uh, we typically pool the LHIA funding, as you know, with the Minnesota Housing Consolidated RFP. Um, and each year we've, we've awarded both to multifamily rental and to home ownership programs under that rubric. Um, and they are always in very high demand. You know, this year we had, um, you know, approximately half of the proposals statewide that could be funded that came in through that request for proposals. And for single family, we had a, about $20 million requested in the metro region and just $12 million available for awards this year. Um, the pilot that we added this year helped to meet some of that demand, and yet, as Ash showed, we still were able to fund just about 24% of the total requests that we had for the affordable ownership pilot this year. And so, we are recommending at the staff level that, that the council consider investing um, unrestricted reserves in the amount required to get to $2.5 million for multifamily and $2.5 million in the affordable homeownership pilot at the minimum. And then if the council were to find additional sources of funding to allocate to LHIA as it has in years past, we believe that it would be, um, you know, we would be able to deploy that funding very easily. So that's another topic that, um, you know, the program staff can't quite make recommendations for, but wanted to point that out. Uh, and then in 2023, you'll notice in the information item, we are proposing to direct single family applications to the home ownership pilot for the second year of the pilot, rather than funding them through the consolidated RFP. This is something to discuss, and it doesn't mean we couldn't do it a different way, go back to the old way in the future. Um, but we found this year with really similar application timing cycles, um, it was just a little bit confusing to have the single family applications through the RFP at the same time as the pilot. And, and we did see very good demand for the pilot, which we weren't sure about until we tried it. Uh, so that would be a staff recommendation for next year to consider as well. Uh, and then Livable Communities Act, 
uh, sorry, the Livable Communities Demonstration Account, LCDA, and the LCDA TOD program both support development and redevelopment projects that link housing, jobs, and services. Ms. Brooke, you want to advance your slide? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lilligren. Uh, so the TOD grants are focused on high-density projects that contribute to a mix of uses, specifically in TOD-eligible areas. That now includes light rail, commuter rail, BRT, high-frequency bus corridors. And then um, those programs both are funded through the LCDA account, which has base funding this year of $13.6 million and um, restricted reserves available to deploy as well. Um, under LCDA and TOD, we also offer the pre-development grant programs and then the policy development grant programs, which were new this last year. Um, Demand was maybe slightly lower in 2022 for LCDA and TOD across the board compared to 2021. However, 2021 was just a banner year for applications. And so we're not sure we see any real trends of reduced demand for these funds. Uh, so we are recommending um, increasing the funding available slightly to account for that ongoing high demand for these programs. Um, the pre-development program and the policy development program were not fully deployed in 2022, um, and so we are going to continue to do outreach and make sure that communities throughout the region are aware of those resources and that they are um, empowered to apply if it's relevant to them. Um, and then at the same time, if funds aren't fully deployed through those programs, they can be rolled into the development grant programs where we've always been able to, to fully deploy all the resources available. Uh, the TOD eligible areas um, we approve each year as well and update them based on the status of various transit corridors um, in their planning and implementation process. So this year there aren't any substantial changes to the eligible areas. So in summary, this year we're recommending a total of 5.5 million for TBRA, 16.6 uh, .6 million for LCDA and TOD combined, and $5 million for LHIA uh, in 2023. Um, note, there is a typo in your written report. So if you're following along with the item that was um, shared online, there's a typo and it, it says $17 million. It should say $16.6 .6 million for LCDA. Um, so last year, as I mentioned, the council did identify $2 million in special initiative support for LHIA. That gave LHIA a total program budget of $6 million across both of the program tracks. Uh, and so this current recommendation before you actually represents a $1 million decline year over year in total LHAA funding available. Um, it is a, a $1 million increase in the funds that we control from our own LCA account though. And so that's just something again to point out. Are there any questions before I get into the scoring framework? Yeah, thank you Ms. Bricky. Questions on what Ms. Bricky's covered so far, Councilmember Lindstrom. Um, in previous years, we've looked under the sofa cushions and we found some extra funds and, and you said a few minutes ago that if we find some sort of similar funds that uh, we can allocate for this for these purposes, where do those funds, where do we typically find those funds and what are the chances that we'll find them again this year? <laughs> Have we gone through all of our sofa cushions? <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent question, which Chair Lilligren, uh, you know, Director Barajas may have additional insight on that. Yeah. Director Barajas. Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you, Council Member Lindstrom. Um, in the past, you may recall that the Council has had uh, funds above the target reserve balance in the general fund uh, that the that you all had allocated as part of special initiatives in each of the calendar years. This past year, as part of your budget conversations for 2023, the year we're in now, mm -hmm. um, the additional funds above, uh, above target reserve balance, some of them uh, were allocated toward a very large uh, internal systems project for all of our kind of back mm -hmm. office accounting, asset management, a, a very important uh, uh, investment in that system. Uh, and so we didn't have further um, special initiatives discussion. Um, but if there is a desire from this committee to 
look for more <laughs> cushions um, to dig under, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with our finance team to see what might be available. We did not fully use what was above target reserve balance in 23. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions before we move on to the scoring framework? Seeing, oh. Mr. Chair, yeah. may I ask, um, I think before we move on, we just want to confirm that, you know, the recommendations that we have in front of you are, you know, consensus, are, are any questions that we might have on those balances or how we've split them or if we want to put more in the reserve and or allocate more out. I'm certainly, those are staff proposal at this point, but would love your input on that. Committee members, Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The only one that I'm kind of eh about is the, the LHIA distribution between the RFP and the pilot. I like the idea of moving the single family just into its own deal so they don't have to deal with all of the Minnesota housing. Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's a lot of work. Um, but I, I'm kind of feeling like three million for multifamily and two million again for single family since we have so much need mm -hmm. for rental affordable housing. Yes. Just sorry, Chair Lillian, yeah, just please. to. You respond. So we did put one million dollars into single family through the RFP this year, in addition to the two million dollars for the pilot. Um, so it was three million dollars this year, and um, it would be less than. But I think that's a really good trade-off to discuss. <laughs> Committee members, other comments? I, I, I think. Um, these are solid proposals. Um, there's a little bit of flex in there um, in terms of, you know, if we can pull from different uh, fund sources. So uh, just really happy about the opportunity that we have, the demand that we have for more affordable housing, which we can't keep up with. So mm -hmm. um, I would definitely be open um, to seeing if we could find some more funds as well. Things and I concur with Councilmember Chambliss and um, and I have a question. This might take us a little off the topic, but I, I I think not too far anyway. But I recently attended a opening of a development in North Minneapolis where there was a lot of praise for the Met Council because due to the variabilities within the development ecosystem, costs escalated considerably during construction and. I'm not sure how we did it, but we helped bridge that um, gap and kept the project on track. And so I, is it from some of these reserve funds? Is that where we're able to step in and support projects that we have previously funded? Or is that powder we should be keeping dry? Or, or otherwise, I concur that we, mm -hmm. we could increase these numbers here. Mr. Chair, council members, I'm a little less familiar with that. We don't typically um, come back and add funds outside of a, or we've never come back to an LHA project and added funds to it outside of our review process here okay. um, and awards that you've seen. Um, it could just be um, on that project that we have more flexibility in the dollars that we've awarded or okay. that they had previously received, say, um, an award through Minnesota Housing and then applied uh, finding a gap then applied to us to fill oh. that gap. So that's a possibility in the sequence there that where we were able to do that. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Yeah, Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could that have been one of the ones where we amended the grant to change the mix of units or something to deal with those sorts of things? And that sounds familiar, I think, yeah. Potentially, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Council Member. Cool. Well, I'm thinking yeah. those were all in St. Paul, but oh. I could oh. be mistaken. <laughs> cool. Anyway, we got a lot of praise, which doesn't always happen. So, it's, yeah. it's cool. Any other discussion before we move on to the scoring framework? Seeing none, Ms. Berkey. Okay. Um, and to your question, if you have the project name, I'd be happy to research and help great. tell the story of, of the role we're able to play because that's really helpful for us great. to understand as well. So, I'll get that to you. Glad they said nice things. <laughs> Okay, so for the scoring framework, um, many of you know much better than I that for the last couple of years, uh, there's been a, a revision to the scoring framework that we've really attempted to root 
with what's in statute as well as what the Thrive 2040 goals are and kind of the council's strategic stated policy objectives. Um, we work to shift the structure of, the, of each of the grant program criteria to really focus on what happens as a result of the grant, how the process is conducted, and, and who is involved and who is represented and, and has engagement in the project. Um, you know, we have in, had internal conversations about projects that were funded and um, staffed in the last couple of years with this criteria. Also implement, implemented what they call a, an equity emergency break so that we don't support programs that actually perpetuate inequitable development outcomes, but we, we make sure that we have a minimum score both for the overall project quality and for its equitable impact. Um, in some of our programs. So there's been a lot of thought put into this and um, certainly some questions about whether we're meeting our goals and we've continued to evaluate these criteria over the last couple of years. We're now coming to the end of essentially the second full year with, with the recommendations for the LHIA affordable home ownership pilot tonight. That was the end of the 2022 funding cycle. And so we now just barely have two years of data to work with. They were very different years in terms of our applications and our, our award decisions. And so staff are very eager to dig into that data this year um, as we continue to understand whether the scoring framework is quite right or not. And um, in general this year, we're recommending uh, keeping the framework intact with some minor changes. Uh, I know Council Member Lilligren, uh, you mentioned that you read in detail the red line scoring criteria, which I, have, I really appreciate, and it is a lot of... As did Council Member Cummings, I know. It's a lot of reading. Um, that said... Yeah. 44 pages. Mm -hmm. so, so staff's intention with that was uh, really to focus on clarity and consistency, making sure that we're very transparent about what we're asking for, that it's understandable to a general audience. Um, the intention was not, in most cases, to make a real substantive change in what we wanted to fund, but just to communicate it better. So I'll just highlight some of the proposals and kind of the categories of changes that are reflected in that red line. Uh, but it's a very detailed markup um, without a lot of major changes in what we're actually asking for, we think, uh, but certainly seek your feedback. So we anticipate recommending more changes for 2024 and possibly looking at the scoring criteria in more depth uh, over this year as we continue to evaluate the data we have. And so both tonight, I'd like you both to look at you know, the current proposal, as well as think about what we should be evaluating and looking at going forward into next year, because these, these conversations take a long time to have, and um, doing the data analysis also takes some time, and we want to be careful about that. Um, so an example of um, one of the major categories of Red Ink you see is the plain language update effort we've been making. Uh, so our staff on the LCA team have worked closely with council communication staff to do a plain language review and ensure that the language in all of our application materials and criteria are very clear. So I provided just an example here of um, ensuring that a more of a lay audience, maybe someone who's not as technically uh, savvy in the world of local government or development would be able to look at this and understand what we're getting at. We hope that the language improvements are successful. At the same time, we see this as kind of an ongoing effort to continue refining. Um, so another category of updates um, was in the jobs and economic opportunity language. Um, so looking at statute and, and our requirement to really affect the long-term incentives that relate to good quality jobs in our region, you know, we really didn't feel that the language we were using was quite clear enough about the full range of projects that would meet LCA goals. Um, so had several projects come through that maybe weren't scoring as well as staff felt that they should based on what we knew our overall goals were and the goals of the council. Um, and so using um, economic opportunity as a way to clarify what we're getting at when we're looking at jobs, that we're looking at kind of a broader view of how good quality living wage jobs are created. Um, that's why there are some language changes in that area throughout the, the programs in all of our, our scoring framework. Uh, really makes more opportunities for job training and workforce development projects to be successful when they align with our broader goals. 
And then the policy development grant program, as I mentioned, was really a pilot this year within the LCDA program overall. Uh, and as a result of, of doing the very first round of applications and talking about you know, why other cities chose to apply or not apply and understanding the total picture of that work, um, staff recommends introducing a minimum score now for funding eligibility for that program so that it's clear that we have a, a cutoff point if there are proposals that don't quite fit. Um, and also gave more weight to policy outcomes rather than, so talking more about what rather than how, like engagement or, or who the team is composed of. So thinking about really the goal of this is to implement good policies that will advance the Thrive 2040 goals. And so we should really emphasize projects that are likely to create those outcomes of good policy. Um, so I could certainly pause here and, and ask about anything else that jumped out to you in the red line if you had a chance to do that close review of it. Um, and then I'll just first do a little overview of the kind of evaluation questions and considerations that staff have in mind um, that have informed both what's coming to you now and as I mentioned already informing what we're thinking about for future changes in the program as we get more data. So we're evaluating our newer pilot programs the homeownership pilot program and the policy development track of LCDA. Um, really want to gather more data points and adjust a little bit along the way, but really see how those are playing out. Um, we're also evaluating trends and applications, and it's very clear coming from discussion at this committee and other, other places that geographic distribution and the ability of every city in the region to have the chance to be successful with a good quality project proposal, that that's a priority of our work. And so we will be continuing to look at um, what might be influencing communities and in being successful or unsuccessful. Um, and that includes that we really are focusing a lot on outreach this year. We, we intend to do outreach to participants who have not applied to LCA in recent years, have not been successful in recent years, and to continue to do outreach to communities that aren't current LCA participants but would be excellent candidates. Um, so would like to get more cities involved in general. Um, as I already mentioned, we're really looking at the effectiveness of the scoring framework that changed a lot in 2021 and it really focused on the outcomes of equity and stewardship within the Thrive 2040 goals. And to better understand all these other questions, we're working on better understanding the role of our own LCA programs within the overall regional development landscape. You know, we're $25 million or so each year is important, but we are operating within a much bigger system. We want to make sure our programs are making a unique and meaningful impact given the resources that we have available in that broader context. Um, and to that end, we have an, uh, you know, ongoing feedback opportunities from various stakeholders, especially applicants who have been both successful and unsuccessful, stakeholder groups like Metro Cities and, and many others who um, are happy to share their feedback with us and that we really um, make an effort to listen to them. Um, and from developers as well as from city staff, um, all the different folks who are driving these projects. So for discussion today, um, with our two overall categories here, you know, wanted your feedback, if you have any additional feedback on the funding availability and demand, we've covered that some already. And then on our evaluation questions for the LCA program, uh, looking at the scoring framework and other aspects of how we run the program um, in this year and in future years, you know, what research questions would you like us to prioritize? Are there scoring elements we should specifically address? And are there other questions we should be sure to take into account before we bring this to you again? Thank you, Ms. Berkey, for the work on this and for teeing up these discussion questions. Committee members, responses to the discussion questions. Councilmember Chambliss. Thank you. Um, I like the list of the, on page 14 of the evaluation considerations and, and questions. Um, I'm particularly interested in getting feedback from the stakeholders in terms of um, the success and unsuccessful applicants and um, finding out as a committee what that information means for us in terms of our policy and administration. Um, and um, I think the timeliness of getting that information is important as well. I know uh, sometimes it takes a while to 
gather all the feedback and all the evaluation um, because we do want to be careful um, in making sure that um, we're, we're operating in a controlled fashion uh, and confidently um, reaching our targets. So I'm, I'm anxious to see that part. Um, and looking at all of these different criteria and factors uh, is not simple. <laughs> I mean, we're dealing with the ecosystem, we're dealing with um, um, a number of things that you know, could uh, impact our results. So I appreciate the expertise of the staff in uh, reviewing uh, and taking their time to evaluate the trends and the needs. Thank you very much. Further discussion, Councilmember Lindstrom. I know I would appreciate it to seeing something relatively soon, like an evaluation or an outreach plan or a plan on how we're going to be evaluating this. Like in February, we're going to be reaching out to city administrators and planners. And in March, we're going to be having focus groups with developers. And then we're going to be bringing that information back, and we're going to have another conversation with the Community Development Committee in April. And we need to make a final decision by September da -da 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 for 2024. And, have, and then for us to see that so that we can weigh in on, on um, oh, you should also make a presentation to the Ramsey County League of Local Governments or Scott County, the scale committee or uh, whatever it might be. Or you should be factoring in this, asking this question. I'd Thank like you. to see that. Ms. Brickey, did you want to respond to that or are you just grabbing... I think, I think um, Chair Lilligrand, I just want to say that I think the suggestion is a probably a helpful one and something we can look at doing. And um, the first thing on the calendar is actually tomorrow. Our annual survey for the LCA programs goes out tomorrow, and we ask for feedback from applicants about their experience with the program and additional resources that they would like to have. So that's the first step, but <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Thank you. For the discussion, Council Member Wolf. Uh, so... We're going to have a challenge here because some members are going to be leaving us and we will be getting some new members. Hopefully those of us that want to stay get to stay, but we don't know that yet. Um, but we're going to be dealing mm -hmm. with onboarding new people mm -hmm. at the same time as we're trying to figure this stuff out, which is going to make it hard. I mean, we've also had a lot of staff changes and I also want to thank you for spending an hour with me before this meeting so that we could I could dig right. through some of the yeah. scoring stuff to understand but it's going to be an uphill battle trying to train in new people because you guys just got where you're comfortable with this and now we're going to get new people again <laughs> um, so it's it's going to be that much more difficult to figure out changes um, with the new people, I, I still have concerns. I, I appreciate the plain language. That's great. I mean, I was reading through that big long thing too <laughs> and, and plain language is definitely better. I didn't realize how weird the language was until I saw the edits, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. But I remain concerned about the scoring itself that it, disadvantages smaller communities and ones that don't have transit and that sort of thing. Um, the, the whole going after the deepest affordability thing sounded great at the time, but what's happening is you can't get any workforce housing funded in the suburbs because it's not below 30% of median income. But a lot of people who are below 30% of median income don't want to live in Farmington or Belle Plaine because there's no transit and no grocery store in Farmington and you can't really function if you don't have a reliable automobile or if you need metro mobility services, which don't exist in either of those communities. So 
I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can work towards something where local needs can be taken care of because that workforce housing thing is a huge issue that we're kind of losing mm -hmm. any interest in with our the way our scoring is right now um, that would help with the, the geographic distribution and have us be able to fund things not just in the core because way back when all of this started, we thought we were gonna keep extending transit to everywhere eventually. And that's really shifted in the last five or so years of recognizing that, nope, we're not gonna be able to extend our transit system everywhere. And so we've gotta deal with what we're gonna have. So I remain very, very, all the things I said before about the scoring, I'm not gonna repeat them because we don't have that long. But I still have all of those concerns about the scoring that I said when I was voting against the, the funding recommendations. Thank you. Thanks for, um, thanks for sharing. And I think, Ms. Berkey, that would mean when we do our outreach priority, it's prioritizing the communities that Councilmember Wolf is uh, referencing. And, I, and then also the, the trends and the geographic distribution. I'm very interested in it. As Ms. Berkey knows, we've had some conversations about it as well. And yeah, so I look forward to it. And I think the first part of your comment, Councilmember Wolf, about the onboarding the new folks, and it is, it's a uphill, it's a vertical learning curve, right? And, uh, and I think that argues for not tampering too much with with the scoring and the, um, that's approved, and, and that's what you're requesting as well, that we get, well, these are still fairly new, and so we may not want to vary too far from what, what we have. That would, that would be one way to interpret anyway what you were saying. Thanks. Further discussion? Mr. Chair. Oh, yeah. Um, I appreciate, Brahas. thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair, and I appreciate your comments, council members, especially on onboarding. Um, it certainly is top of mind for us as well. And um, I know it's something uh, that you'll be seeing from us uh, in upcoming meetings around our upcoming work plans for this committee, but we're in the thick of work planning for this year right now and getting those details in order and reserving significant time for potential onboarding and deeper dive discussions one-on-ones with new members and existing members too, wherever you want to be digging in further on, on work that we may have been doing or 44 pages of reports that we might give to you. <laughs> you know, just know that that time is something that we, we do want to be sure that you know is available to you as well and we're happy to, to, to make that time for those discussions um, when at your, at your convenience as well, but definitely uh, work planning will be a continued part of this conversation at the committee. I appreciate that, thanks. Ms. Berkey, to the, your uh, discussion questions, the one, uh, are there scoring elements we should specifically address, or you referenced also, you know, I, uh, a comment I made about one thing I noticed in the uh, redlined uh, draft, and and I'm guessing it was a, an edit or a change that was made based on redundancy, and maybe I just don't know where it kind of appeared. Uh, but I noticed a lot of strike throughs on references to in, um, public realm improvements mm. that are uh, associated with a project. And I just know in my own district, those have been really key dollars that have influenced projects to be better at their public realm interfaces and have created some significant amenities. And so, so I'm just wondering, was that an exercise in eliminating redundancy? And I just didn't see where sort of the public realm improvements are, are addressed in the scoring elements, or is it a change? Are we sort of shifting our priorities away from the public realm improvements and focusing on other parts of the development? Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize, I don't have yeah. pages and to cite here. But. Great question, Chair Lilgren. Um, I can try to respond, but I also may be able to provide better information and a follow-up um, with the folks who did the detailed red line work. Um, on our team, but I do see that you know, yeah, the description of the public realm is crossed out in several programs. Um, 
And I believe the intention is just to replace that with language that isn't jargon, but means the same thing. Uh, and okay. so if it means something different, we need to know that. And I would, okay. I would appreciate your feedback on that. Um, but it's, um, you know, welcoming public realm was crossed out, but, um, you know, infrastructure for people to safely and effectively bike, walk, bike, or roll, priority for projects that connect to walking, biking, or transit networks around okay. the project site are some of the language that's there that is a little more straightforward. Um, and let's see what else I have. Um, but uh, staff also mentioned it is a matter of some redundancy elimination, that there, it's not that we're not looking at the public realm, it's um, framing it more in like, what is the person's experience on the site, okay. and also not overstating the public realm criteria over and over again in a way that's not effective. Okay. Thank you. I that's the intention. That. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just remembered one more thing that we talked about earlier before uh -huh. the meeting. Um, as, when we've been doing all these scoring discussions, Tara would always say we're going to have sort of different scoring so that like communities are scored alike rather than saying, you know, Belle Plain doesn't have an LRT, so, <laughs> you know, you can't compare them to, to Minneapolis. With all the staff changes, I just wanted to... Uh, make sure that that's correct, that my memory is correct on what we talked about in terms of how we evaluate communities to make sure that that gets passed on to our new staff and not lost in the discussion. Yeah. Hey, Director Brahas. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, uh, Councilmember Wolf, thank you for reminding us of that. And certainly a lot of the discussion that we've been having is around context. Um, so what's the local community's context um, and what local need are they fulfilling? And that certainly you saw that in the pilot um, and that will, that will show up in some places and now it's a little mush of, in my brain of all of those places, but definitely context because we have been seeing those projects too. We're like, this is great for this community, but it's only like four jobs, right? When we've got this project over here, that's 175 jobs and they're like falsely competing for that. So it certainly is one of those, um, really tough balancing acts to try to figure out how you get the numbers to work in the right way, but that's definitely something that's top of mind for us. Thank you. Yes, thanks, yeah. Director Rise, and thanks for bringing that up, Council Member Wolf. Further, yeah, Ms. Berkey. I could just add to that. Please. Um, just a little that, you know, we, we've we never had different scoring for different communities, but context is intended. I had I had a conversation with staff after we talked to Council Member Wolf and just clarified my understanding of how the programs actually work. Um, and it, it, the intention is to take context into consideration within the scoring criteria. Um, there are some criteria where you know, number of housing units, for example, will always be something that we look at. And so a 50 unit building will score better than a 20 unit building in general. And, um, but on many other aspects of the scoring, there is that context element where of course we don't expect a, a light rail station to be in every community in our region. And so we don't, you know, penalize people accordingly in that way, or at least that's not the intention. Thank you. Councilmember Member Vento. I, I don't, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't mean to sound like I'm jumping on what you just said, but did you say a 60 unit building will be preferable over a 20 unit building? Um, yeah, so just to clarify, yeah, when, we, when we're looking at projects, we kind of, we do look at them relative to each other within okay. a given funding round and a project that is going to create more affordable housing units will generally score better than one that is gonna create fewer affordable housing units. Um, but it's not always that simple because okay. you can certainly be funded without creating any housing units at all if you're creating jobs and, and so on. And so it's a balance. Mr. Chair, yeah, if I could, I'd just like to make a point. This is, doesn't deal with uh, any kind of a grant that this project has gotten from, from the Met Council, but I live near an area where a new development is going in. It's huge. And there are growing concerns about the impact on traffic. So I just want to make a point mm -hmm. that, while I understand why those bigger units are beneficial, they may not always be wise <laughs> for a whole lot of reasons. So I hope that just the, the, 
the number is taken into consideration in terms of what various communities have available for space, um, both geographically for the structure as well as for transportation and other issues. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would also add that that might pertain to the size of the grant. You're going to give more right. money to a 100-unit building. But that doesn't mean that an eight-unit building isn't important to a community. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Good point. Excellent point. You said it better than I did. <laughs> Further questions or comments mm -hmm. on this report? And hearing none, Ms. Berkey. Take it home. Oh, you had your, oh, did we already the go last through that? slide, sure, um, sure, is just a reminder of where we are in the timeline for this discussion, as is currently proposed. So today, we're just discussing everything. Um, we'll take this feedback. Oh, slide, yes, OK. <laughs> so we'll take this feedback. Um, we will bring the fund distribution plan, including the scoring criteria, you know, as we're required to do each year, to the committee at the February 6th. Um, meeting. So that will be the next meeting of this committee if that's acceptable to everyone. And then if that were the case and it were approved, then it would get um, on the agenda for the Metropolitan Council meeting on February 15th. Right. Um, and that would allow us to then publish program materials and, and really begin in earnest the outreach to all the potential applicants very soon after that date of approval. So staff are eager to get going, um, and but we want to get it right. Thank you, Councilmember Bento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recall when um, I first came on the council, we were invited to participate in a workshop um, over at the Wellstone Center um, re with, I, and I can't even remember all the people that were involved. I think it was primarily developers, wasn't it, Lisa? Hannah <laughs> let it, and I know you were there. Boy. Yeah, well, anyway, but my point was, it doesn't matter what it was, it had, had to do with livable communities, and it was, it was a great conversation um, opportunity. As a new council member, it was really instructive, but if we continue to do those types of things, and there are opportunities to invite council members to come and listen <laughs> and, and just hear what, what folks are saying, I, I think it would be great for anybody who's going to be onboarding in the next couple of months and any of us who might be returning who are interested in that. Excellent suggestion. Mm -hmm. And maybe those who go will be, have better memories than I do and will remember exactly what that session was. But right. It was pre-COVID, Councilmember oh, Bento, so mm -hmm. it's all kind of a haze. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Back then, yeah. Uh, further discussion, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would like to point out that this lovely slide, um, the picture on the lovely slide is on the artery in Hopkins, which ah, is beautiful. funded, and it's wonderful. It goes from our downtown station and ties uh, that all the way down to Main Street and invites people to stroll the artery. There's art all along the way. Oh, it has won artery. awards. It is absolutely fabulous, okay. and it is successful in part due to funding from the Met Council. So, okay. hey, Thank wonderful. you for pointing that out, and congratulations. It's cool. Thanks. Further discussion? Good evening, Ms. Berkey. Thanks so much. We look forward to seeing this again. Congratulations on your first presentation in yeah. front of this committee. I think you're getting rave reviews <laughs> on your performance. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Director Ra has anything else for the good of the committee, else? Michelle? No, I do not. No? All right. Seeing no further business before this committee, we're adjourned. Thank you.